panamensis uh, and they have sequenced that particular organism and they have developed so many uh, uh, drug products also nagarjuna but uh, he, he did phd with uh, ricardo uh, uh, carlos did phd with us i taught him carlos is my student <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Uh, in 2011 or 12, I think, no, I, or 13, I don't remember exactly. Yeah, 11, 30. 11, 12. Uh, yes. But still bachelor, eligible bachelor. Uh, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's okay, Carlos. I also... Both are. Yes. Uh, very nice to see both of you. Uh, uh, So Thank you very was, nice to see you too, Professor Sambasiva. Yes, um, I'm getting uh, age now. <laughs> I say everyone, yeah. <laughs> it is all. It's almost uh, no sixty-two. I am sixty-two. We have almost the same, the same age. Yes, sir. Um, what do you? Fifty, fifty. I let me see if I can calculate fifty-seven. Yes, yes. <laughs> live to YouTube. Okay, okay. Uh, it is now live on YouTube. So I will take leave and I will I will be watching you. Uh, okay. Okay. Very okay. good. Thank you. Huh? <laughs> Okay, the, let us start. You can start introduction. Yes, today our uh, webinar program. Good morning, everyone. Welcome, Dr. Ricardo Leonard, and Dr. Carlos, and all the online participants. I am Dr. Itzler Rajola, Department of Biotechnology, Mizoram University, India. Today we have an esteemed scientist, uh, Dr. Ricardo Leonard, and. Uh, Dr. Carlos, Dr. Ricardo Leonard is from uh, Center for Cellular and Molecular Biology of Diseases, the Institute for Scientific Research and High Technology Services of Panama, Republic of Panama. His uh, research lines are genomic, population genetics, and development of drugs and vaccine against Leishmania species. dengue virus and neurodegenerative disease if you have any query just post in the q and a then we'll open after this presentation now let us hand over our webinar program to dr ricardo leonard okay thank you very much I would like to thank the university for being uh, so kind to invite me for this uh, this talk. So I'm going to share uh, my screen now. So is this uh, audio okay? Can you hear me? Okay, I'm going to share this uh, uh, presentation I have here. So I can uh, share with you some of our results concerning Leishmania, Leishmaniasis, and genomic research. So we are talking about uh, Leishmaniasis. Is uh, is a very important disease here in, in Panama and uh, it's caused by a parasite and uh, this uh, parasite is causing a lot of uh, uh, deforming uh, scars and, and a lot of lesions like, like the one you can see here in this in this slide. Uh, these are some of the examples of the most common presentation we have in Panama and it's cutaneous leishmaniasis. And as you can see, it has a, a, a very important uh, 
very important effect on patients and sometimes it even deform faces and, and it's, it's really a huge problem of, uh, of uh, human health. So what is Leishmania? Leishmania is a parasite that is, it has two, uh, two forms. It's a so-called degenetic parasite. Let me see if I can uh, use my laser. It has two main forms. It has the promastigote, which is this uh, flagellated motile form. And this promastigote is the way, is uh, the form that lives inside an insect, which is the, the, uh, the sandfly. And it also has this, uh, this uh, amastigote form that lives inside the macrophage in humans. So it has two forms, one form which is uh, not motile, it has one form which is motile, and it has a vector which is the sunfly. So it's rather a uh, complicated uh, life cycle. We have the uh, vectors and mainly uh, sunflies and old world phlebotomous uh, species in the new world, like in Panama, we have Lutsomia as a, as a vector. And the main reservoir is the sloth. As you can see here, this is a very nice animal. It's everywhere here in Panama and Central America and some other countries in the neotropics. But a huge proportion of these animals are infected and they are carriers of uh, Leishmania. So uh, whenever you go into the, uh, in, in contact with these two elements, you will get infected. It's, it's, it's a very, very common situation. We are talking, we are going to be talking today about Leishmania panamensis. Leishmania panamensis is here. We are talking about, uh, talking about, uh, classification of these parasites. We are talking about protozoa of the order Kynetoplastida and the family Trypanosomatidae. And this family Trypanosomatidae has very important, some very important genuses, like for example, Leishmania and Trypanosoma, which cause a lot of uh, trouble in, in, in humans. Uh, Leishmania genus has two uh, important uh, subdivisions is subgenus Leishmania and subgenus Dianian. And uh, in, in the down direction, we have uh, complexes, complexes of several species. And in the case of uh, Panamensis, we have it here, Leishmania Panamensis, is in the, is in the Leishmania Guyanensis complex. So Leishmania Panamensis, in fact, has a a quite longer name. It has a, it is Leishmania Viania Panamensis, because Viania is the subgenus. And we are going to see in a few minutes that uh, the subgenus subdivision is very important for uh, pathogenesis and some other important things. Here you can see two pictures with the two forms in the way you can look at them in the microscope. This is the amastigote form. It's growing inside the macrophage, the human macrophage. And this is the promastigote, which is the motile form. You can see here flagella in all these forms. It's very motile. And uh, this is the way the parasite, you can encounter the parasite inside the insect vector. You can also, uh, by the way, you can also culture very easily this form of the parasites. So some important uh, data about leishmaniasis and the, the problems they, they cause, they, uh, there are some estimates that there are uh, almost 400 people at risk for cutaneous leishmaniasis in the world. Practically all the tropics you can find uh, cutaneous leishmaniasis. We have about uh, almost 600 people and danger of getting visceral leishmaniasis. Fortunately, we don't have visceral leishmaniasis here in Panama, but this is the form that it may be deadly. So you can, you can die of visceral leishmaniasis if, if not treated. 
and, and this is happening in about 12 most infected countries. And every year, about a million people and, uh, are infected and uh, thousands uh, are dead because of these uh, important parasites. In Leishmania, we have uh, already described about uh, 30 species. About 20 of them are pathogenic to humans. Some of the species of Leishmania are very specific for, for example, lizards. And those are not uh, important for humans, but uh, about 20 of them are important for humans. About uh, 90 sunfly species are able to transmit Leishmania parasites. So uh, the, there is a huge potential for transmission of the parasites. And uh, we have already mentioned some of the cases, some of the morbid lethality related to visceral leishmaniasis. These are some in the neotropics only, the uh, localization of uh, cutaneous leishmaniasis uh, uh, species and cases. And as, as you can see here, uh, this is Panama. In Panama, you can find mainly Panamensis. And Panamensis guyanensis is the, the guyanensis uh, uh, complex. But uh, you can see that all those countries in the neotropics are affected by several, several species. And in the case of Colombia, for example, you will see several species at the same time. So there is a lot of uh, problems with these parasites. In the case of uh, visceral leishmaniasis, you can find a lot of uh, problem also in the neotropics. It is, it is being caused by Leishmania infantum. Fortunately, we don't have it in, here in Panama. It's very rare, even in Colombia, but it's very common, unfortunately, in Brazil. And even in the north of South America, it's, it's also a huge problem. So in Panama, the main species is uh, Leishmania panamensis. As I told you, there are, have been some sporadic reports of uh, Leishmania mexicana, Leishmania amazonensis, Leishmania colombiensis, brasiliensis, and infantum. But this is very old data. Uh, uh, we have been uh, reported to have at least five species of uh, Lutzomia vectors that efficiently transmit the parasite. We have about 3,000 new cases every year, new cases. And there is a huge under report of about 50%. This is because we have several uh, very remote regions in the world, in the, in the country that are not uh, very well connected to uh, public services, uh, health. And uh, in many of those indigenous communities, people do not uh, usually report the disease. They go for uh, traditional medicine and some other uh, options. Uh, as we have mainly Leishmania panamensis, most of the cases we have are mostly uh, Leishmaniasis, cutaneous Leishmaniasis. It is estimated that about 5% of those cases, however, they do progress to uh, uh, mucocutaneous uh, presentation. And this presentation is, is even worse because this presentation is a, uh, is a kind of metastatic uh, presentation in which you, the parasite colonize all the, uh, the mucus in the nose and the mouth. And then you will have a lot of uh, deformed uh, scars in, in your face and this is usually uh, uh, very resistant uh, leishmania very difficult to treat and in some cases it produce uh, it produce uh, permanent uh, uh, deforming uh, uh, consequences so we have been working for a while for several years in, in, in dikasat Leishmaniasis. Some of the projects are already uh, closed, finished. Uh, Dr. Restrepo here, he had, he can tell you. I don't, I don't, I'm not quite sure if he's going to talk about it, but he will, uh, he will talk. I think he will talk mainly about the post genome uh, research we have been doing. But before the genome, we were developing molecular markers for 
studying genetic diversity of parasites in Panama. And, and in that project, we develop a, a very interesting uh, uh, system called AFLPs and microsatellites. And, and Carlos did a very good job in that, uh, in that project we were able to obtain some very interesting results. And, uh, um, we are not going, to, because of the time, we are not going to talk about it right now. Uh, we also have one researcher, one uh, Dr. Janice, working in the development of an animal model, a murine animal model, for testing new uh, antiparasite drugs, new anti leishmanian drugs. And she has been doing a very good job at developing the murine model, adapting the uh, Leishmania paramensis to, the, to this model. Leishmania paramensis is, a, is, a, uh, is a, a little bit tricky parasite to grow. And it, it, it is very difficult to infect animals with Leishmania parasites for some reason. But uh, at, this point, at this moment, we have a model that we can use for the testing of new antiparasite, new anti-Leishmania drugs. We have been working for a while searching for new anti leishmanian drugs. And they are Dr. Spalafora and Dr. Janes. Uh, they have been doing a lot of uh, screening with uh, a lot of compounds. And some of the compounds have interesting, very interesting uh, activities. Uh, we are not going to talk about that. So after developing molecular markers for uh, leishmania, uh, we had the opportunity to uh, uh, do the complete sequencing of the, uh, of the genome of the Leishmania palamensis. And we did that because we had in mind the possibility to identify new drug targets, uh, eventually new vaccines, and, and some of these uh, uh, post-genome uh, works are going to be exposed today by uh, Dr. Carlos. He's going probably to talk about the, this project we have, which is uh, studying the genetic determinants of resistant to drugs in Leishmania paramensis. So talking about the uh, project, about the genome of Leishmania paramensis, uh, we, uh, we employed, uh, 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 at that moment, it was a very, very new uh, methodology we use the uh, Roche 454 platform, which is already dead. It's not there anymore. And we use that platform to uh, generate about a 30 H coverage of, uh, of reads using next generation sequencing about the parasite from the parasites. And we use both uh, direct reads and, and made pair reads. And that's, uh, allow us to, to have about the 30%, 30x uh, coverage of the genome. And then we went on the assembly and we went on the scaffolding and all the uh, bioinformatics uh, methodology to, to obtain the, the final genome. But uh, one important thing is that we also employed a second strategy and we use a completely different uh, uh, platform that was very new at the moment. It was the Illumina uh, platform. And that allowed us to uh, obtain about 30 million reads from the same uh, whole genomic DNA. And then we use these uh, reads to complement the reads obtained with the 454. Uh, the 454 is a very good system because, because it, it allows to obtain uh, pretty large segments of uh, of reads, uh, about uh, 400 uh, base pair, but uh, they also have some particular problem with uh, some particular sequences like repeats, for example. And combining these two different platforms, you are able to correct the errors that you obtain in the 454 uh, uh, platform. And in that case, we followed uh, uh, an in-house uh, developed uh, pipeline using several software, uh, open source software, in a way that uh, we use mainly the 454 data for doing the assembly, doing the validation, doing the correction, 
And then we complement, as I told you, with the Illumina data, which is a, it was about four or five uh, gigabases. And then we went to continuation and annotation using some of the already available uh, genomes. At the moment, it was a major, and I think uh, a couple of uh, genomes more. And uh, we also did some de novo gene predictions. So we combine all those uh, 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 results from those procedures. And then out of 4 million short reads uh, that uh, we obtained at the beginning, we were able to uh, obtain uh, about uh, 100 scaffolds. And then about 100 scaffolds, we were able to correct uh, about 9,000 errors. And then we finally got to about 35 pseudomolecules. And then we finally obtained 35 uh, pseudochromosomes. So uh, in, that, in that way, we were able to, uh, to complete uh, the full genome. Uh, here you can see in this table some of the results we already published about that genome. And uh, we obtained a genome of, for Panamensis that was uh, 35 uh, chromosomes uh, in the range of uh, size of chromosome, the same range of the other uh, already published uh, genomes uh, for other species. Uh, we got about uh, 30 megabases genome, which is about 30, 31, 32 megabases for, for Leishmania about 60% uh, uh, GC content, as already reported, uh, about uh, almost 8,000 protein coding genes and a huge number of pseudogenes. And also we were able to characterize a, a, a number of uh, non-coding RNAs, as you can see here, transfer RNA, ribosomal RNA, small nuclear RNA, small nuclear RNA. So, uh, this is uh, the summary of the results of the, of the sequencing. Uh, here you can see a comparison of the, uh, our El Panamensis uh, genome with the uh, Leishmania brasiliensis genome that was the, the other Diania genome that was already sequenced. And it was sequenced several years ago using a completely different methodology so in this case, you can see that the uh, structurally they are uh, quite similar, except some regions in which there were some uh, annotation and, and uh, assembly errors in the El, El Brasiliensis uh, uh, genome. And you can see that there are some trans transposition, inversions, misplacement and, and the, in the genome. So, uh, uh, in this way, we were able to compare Leishmania panamensis to the closest possible uh, species, which was Leishmania uh, brasiliensis. So this is a layout of uh, the uh, protein coding genes uh, in, the, in the Leishmania panamensis genome. Um, in this case, we were able, as I told you, to uh, to characterize almost 8,000 genes. And um, let me see for a minute here. Just a second, please. So you can see here that uh, uh, this, uh, this genome has uh, 35 chromosomes. The 25, the 20 chromosome, the chromosome number 20 is this big because it is, it comes from a fusion. Uh, all warless manias, they used to have uh, 36 chromosomes, but uh, uh, in this case, this uh, chromosome 20 is coming from a fusion uh, of two, uh, of two chromosomes. So in this way, we have uh, a genome, which is uh, 35 chromosome. And uh, you can see here, if you have a very sharp eye, that uh, uh, the, um, the genome is completely, each chromosome is organized in what is called polycystronic gene clusters. So uh, 
And these polycystronic gene clusters are organized in both the strands of the of the of each chromosome. So it is it's a, it is a very very tight tightly packed uh, genome. Um, in in this case, well, it's a little bit difficult to see, but you can see that uh, uh, in red, some some of the genes are, have been already experimentally characterized. So the genes have some uh, uh, certainty that uh, those genes are those genes. But in some cases, like in this light, uh, light green here, no, uh, there is no model for assignment or function. And, and the, it is about 60% of the genome is, is on known function. So uh, there is really a huge potential for developing, uh, for example, new targets or possible new vaccines out of this uh, unknown uh, genome. And, and the same graph we have also uh, uh, depicted, although it is uh, very difficult to see because uh, there, there are very small lines like in here, this, all this blue and uh, different shades of uh, non-coding RNAs. We have characterized all the genes for transfer RNA, ribosomal RNA, small nuclear RNA and small nuclear RNA and some other non-coding RNAs, but uh, it is a little bit difficult to see at this moment. So uh, we also uh, were able to show that uh, this genome, in the same way that it was already reported for some other uh, genomes in Leishmania, is full of uh, repetitive kind of mobile uh, sequences. And here you can see in this uh, in this graph. Uh, the whole structure of all the different repetitive sequences that uh, are associated to mobile elements like a CIDR, CIDR2, CIDR1, DIR, TATE, TATE related, and even some repetitive regions that are not even characterized, the one in, in yellow. So the genome, even though it is tightly packed, it has a lot of mobile elements. So we are going to see a signature of that in the next uh, in the next slide. So we went to uh, annotation. We follow uh, a pretty well standard uh, uh, procedure for uh, using all these tools for annotation. And then we were able to show that uh, there are number of uh, a number of genes that are. Uh, uh, shared by different Leishmania. And this, and this is a Venn diagram in which we can compare what genes are shared between different uh, Leishmania species. And in this case, you can see here Leishmania, this, this here is Leishmania infantum mexicana. And this one here is El Major. And this one here is Brasiliensis. And this one here is uh, Panamensis. If you do this, uh, 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 Venn diagram again today is going to be so complicated that uh, you are not going to be able to explain it very easily because now there are so many uh, different uh, Leishmania species genomes. Uh, that, uh, but uh, anyway, here you can see very easily when you compare this, uh, these two groups here, Brasiliensis and uh, Panamensis are the Viania, Leishmania Viania subgenus. And here we have the Leishmania, Leishmania subgenus. And for the first time, we were able to compare uh, genomes from Viania subgenus against genomes from uh, Leishmania, Leishmania subgenus. And uh, we were able to show that there is a number of uh, genes that are absent in uh, Viania and there are all the genes that appear to be exclusive for the ania. And we are going to see some of those genes uh, in, in a minute. So we also compare the uh, representation of uh, gene orthology terms in the genomes. And in this case, uh, we were able to show that uh, in 
uh, regarding the number of genes, there are some ontology terms, that means genes, or, or, or genes uh, as, as visualized as functions that are overrepresented in Viania subgenomes. For example, if you can see here in the panel A is molecular processes and the panel B is cellular functions. All these bars, which are uh, completely blue, represent processes, represent groups of processes or functions of genes that are overrepresented in, uh, in Viania. And we were able to show that uh, most of those uh, groups belong to uh, mobilization or transformation or processing of uh, nucleic acids. And this is consistent with the presence of an active RNA interference pathway, which is not present in Leishmania, Leishmania subgenome, and uh, probably because of their active uh, mobile elements. So uh, we also analyzed the, uh, uh, the SOMI uh, of, the, of the genome um, because some of the uh, previous report were showing that uh, some Leishmania species were di diploid and some other reports show that uh, some other Leishmania species uh, are supposed to be uh, triploid or even even higher SOMI. And we did that by using the same, uh, once we had the L. panamensis uh, assembled chromosome, we performed what is called a rib depth analysis. And we did that by uh, mapping all the short reads from Illumina uh, platform on top of the assembled uh, chromosome, completely assembled chromosome, finally, uh, final assemblage. And then we were able to show that in some cases, uh, the depth of reads, in this case, you have increased uh, depth. Using this this uh, region, you can using this uh, approach, you can identify regions which are uh, somehow correlated with the num the number of sequences in the genome, whether it is uh, sequences that are amplified or uh, whether it is the whole the whole chromosome that uh, uh, it is uh, in a different number of uh, molecules. So doing this analysis, we were able to show that some of the chromosomes are overrepresented in number of reads. And in the case of, for example, the 31, you can see here that the mean is completely different from here and from here and from here. And uh, in, in, that, uh, in that way, we were able to show that uh, Leishmania panamensis is apparently uh, uh, an aneuploid. Aneuploid means that uh, it has different numbers of chromosomes. And while practically all the chromosomes are diploid, there are uh, some chromosomes like uh, the, uh, uh, these two chromosomes here and this chromosome here, 23 and uh, 4 and 2, which are triploid. And there is even one chromosome, the chromosome 31, which is tetraploid. So uh, at this moment, we, uh, uh, we were quite sure that this is the, the situation in Leishmania panamensis. Now, uh, uh, as Carlos is going to uh, talk to you probably, well, now we know that this is very strain dependent. And our strain was, uh, the one we used for the sequencing was on a strain that was, uh, uh, propagated in the laboratory for a number of years. And uh, different strains of, uh, of Leishmania panamensis may have different SOMI, as you will see in a moment. Um, but I'm not going to tell you what the results are. So you have to wait for Carlos to, to talk about it. So, um, this is the summary of the SOMI we already have been talking about. And this is also uh, a, a picture showing you uh, 
uh, a number of uh, uh, the gene copy number variations. Those are genes that are present in, in families. They are not individual. They are uh, duplicated in, during the course of evolution and they form families. And sometimes they are in, the, in the genome, there are several places in different chromosomes where you have families of one particular kind of gene. And this is, uh, you can see with the different colors here, the haploid copy number of different genes and some of them are very well uh, repeated in the, the genome. Like for example, these, all these stars are uh, marking the amastine uh, gene arrays. Amastine is a, it's a cell surface glycoprotein that is present in, in gene families. It, it, it has a huge number of uh, genes uh, some species uh, have already 50, 60 uh, genes. And this amastine uh, uh, protein it is, is very specific of the amastigotes. And it has been uh, associated with the survival of the amastigote inside the uh, Parasitophorus vacuole of the microphage. So uh, you can see here all the blue stars are where the amastine gene clusters are, but there are several other uh, uh, gene families. So we also uh, characterize that uh, there is a huge number of amplified uh, sequences in the genome. All these little blue uh, dots that you can see here are different uh, uh, regions that are amplified in the genome. And uh, even some of these regions are amplified. Now we know that they are amplified as, a, as an extra chromosomal circle. And some of these, uh, uh, some of the genes in this uh, amplified uh, extra chromosomal uh, episodes are important for some particular functions in, in this manner. So we are going to see next a table with some of the gene arrays that we were able to identify. And the, the highest number possible is the amastine surface glycoprotein. In some other species of Leishmania, as I told you, uh, amastine was characterized to be about 50, 60 copies of genes of this amastine gene. But we found uh, in the uh, upload number, we found 80. And you can see some of the other, some, some of these factors, uh, some of these uh, genes are already known by virulence factors. Like for example, GP63 is a metalloprotease that is, uh, is present in the, it's very well expressed in the surface of the chromastigote. It has a number of functions. It has several important functions and it is well recognized as a virulence uh, determinant in this manner. But there are so many different, uh, you can see some of the heat shock proteins, for example, very important. Also characterized as virulence uh, factors. Uh, transporters, very important for resistance, as Carlos is going to tell you. And, and many, many different uh, amplified uh, molecules. Uh, this is a little bit uh, higher detail of what happened in what we found in chromosome 34 where we, if this is the uh, usual coverage of the reads, of Illumina reads mapped onto the, uh, onto the uh, chromosome, we found two regions that were highly amplified, this one here and this one here. And this region here in particular is very interesting because this region is, uh, is containing uh, the L LD1 region and it has this mini chromosome that is the one that is growing in some strains of Leishmania as an episome. An episome is a circular molecule that behaves like a mini chromosome. And in this piece here, this is about 120 kilobases or so, we found several important genes related to virulence. 
some important genes, for example, like the ABC, ABC type of uh, transporter in, uh, involved in resistance to uh, antimonials and, and some other important genes. So uh, this, uh, this draft uh, was already uh, uploaded to the NCBI database. Uh, it is now the reference genome for Leishmania paramensis. Uh, so it, is, uh, it's, it, it was a very successful uh, uh, project that we developed in, the, in our institute. And um, let me show you some of the uh, final uh, uh, summary of some of the results. Uh, we have found, for example, that some of the uh, important small nucleolar RNA genes in chromosome 35 uh, uh, are not present in Leishmania major, but uh, they are here in, in, in Leishmania paramensis, and they are similar to T. brucei, T. panosoma brucei, and apparently they are only present in Vianna. And those are important for RNA processing, uh, stability, and maturation. We have uh, uh, described new functions for about 300 genes. And uh, as I told you, we have already about uh, uh, a little bit more than 7,000 groups of orthologs already uh, with the function described. Uh, we have found strong divergence between uh, Leishmania, Leishmania subgenomes and Leishmania Viania subgenomes. And, some of these uh, example of divergence are, for example, the PS, PSA2 GP46 uh, genes. This is a gene uh, present in a protein present in the uh, in the promastigode in the surface of the promastigode, the same as the GP63, as I already told you. Uh, it is involved in the interaction with the microphage. And also the genes that participate in the synthesis and modification of the lipophosphoglycan. This lipophosphoglycan is a very important uh, molecule that uh, form the, this kind of coat of the parasites and protect the parasite against uh, the attack of complement and, and it is important for the infection. So these, uh, these uh, genes are uh, so-called galactosyl transferases. Uh, they are very well uh, diverge from, from those present in Leishmania, Leishmania. We also have some interesting results, like for example, we did not find any gene for uh, uh, arabinosyl transferases. Uh, so this is consistent with the fact that then now we can say that it is most probably that in Leishmania, Viania, uh, the, there is no uh, final, uh, there is no modification with arabinose in the lipophosphoglycan. There is, uh, instead they use glu glucose for, the, uh, for this particular glycosylation. And uh, we have found that there is a much higher number of pseudogenes in paramensis as compared with L major and uh, Leishmania phantom. We have found that, uh, for example, some genes are uh, converted to pseudogenes. That means they are not active anymore in the process of uh, probably uh, recent evolution. Like, for example, the gene for adenine, adenine phosphoribosyl transferase. Uh, this is a gene that uh, participates in the purine savage. Uh, uh, as you probably know, Leishmania cannot cannot produce uh, adenine purines by itself. So they, they have to scavenge purines out of other molecules. And for that, they have uh, three well-defined enzymes. And this is one of the enzymes that uh, uh, do that uh, scavenging. Some genes are lost by deletion. For example, one in nucleotide binding protein is absent in paramensis. And some genes uh, uh, are new, like uh, this, uh, this transporter here, the equilibrative uh, nucleoside transporter. It has no orthologs in, in Leishmania, Leishmania. And probably this is related to 
remember what we saw in the, uh, in the uh, analysis of orthodox, where we observe increased processing of uh, nucleic acids. We have probably uh, uh, new uh, additional genes, uh, like for example, uh, there is an additional copy for glutathione peroxidase. This is a very important uh, gene for, uh, it helps the parasite dealing with uh, uh, reactive oxygen species. So it deals with, it, it probably helped the parasite to deal better with oxidative stress. Why uh, uh, this there, is there any relationship with, for example, the fact that uh, Leishmania parasites have a much broader uh, range of, uh, of uh, host uh, reservoirs and, and, and even uh, uh, insects that are able to transmit the parasite, we don't know. We also have a, a this is a very intriguing uh, finding. Uh, we have one gene that has some homology with the tyrosine dopa decarboxylase uh, enzyme find, found in other, in other systems, in other organisms. And it's intriguing because uh, this particular gene in other organisms is supposed to be uh, involved in the uh, in the synthesis of some neurotransmitter, neurotransmitter uh, uh, molecule like uh, like uh, dopamine, for example. There's we don't we don't have any clue about what is the the relevance of this uh, of this enzyme in this point. So um, some other important things, uh, GP63 metalloprotease, this is a think metalloprotease. It has an increased number of copies. Does it have any relationship with the fact we already know that Leishmania has a broader distribution? We don't know. Uh, some of the other genes are already expanded, like, for example, the uh, delta amastin subfamily. We already talked about the amastin. And uh, maybe the fact that we have more diverged uh, genes in this family uh, may explain the fact that we have a broader distribution in, in Piania uh, species. And uh, there are differences, important differences in, in critical genes, like we talk about the uh, GP63, uh, we talk about uh, mercaptic pyruvate sulfur uh, transferase, we talk about glutathione reductase, we talk about uh, the particular fumarate reductase. So are these genes uh, responsible for, uh, for example, the metastatic ability we have found in, in some of the Viania uh, parasite, we don't know. That, that, that's a very good uh, working hypothesis for future work. So in general, we can say out of our work that uh, 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 Leishmania panamensis is extremely, uh, it, it shows extreme plasticity. We are going to show uh, we are going to see some of the results of that in the next presentation. And uh, we have some clues indicating that, in fact, in, in the Shmania Panamensis, there is a presence of active RNA interference machine, machinery, and possibly uh, mobile elements. We know that now that the pseudogene formation is quite more common in Tiania than in, in Leishmania. We have much more. Uh, pseudogene information. There is a, uh, a large, large di sequence diversity for some other important genes uh, that may be or may be not related with differences in, in ins insect stage development. I told you vector and reservoir usage in, in the vector in the Leishmania. And uh, we have a uh, mobile elements that uh, resemble those found in Trypanosoma species, supporting the idea that the Viania subgenus diverge very early in, uh, in the evolution 
from the Lichmania Lichmania uh, subgenus. So this is what I uh, had for you today. Uh, uh, these are some of the uh, key people here. Carlos is here. He was. Uh, he has been working a lot with the post uh, Lichmania project. Alejandro Janes is. Uh, is also very. Uh, he has been uh, key in the genome analysis. He is a biochemist with uh, specialization in bioinformatics. And he has done all the analysis, and we have to uh, acknowledge a, a lot of help from uh, uh, a lot of different people from different institutions, and even from different uh, international institutions. We had a cooperation with the in, uh, Sanger Institute in, in the UK, and uh, of course we want to uh, acknowledge the uh, the PhD program we had with uh, Asharia Nagarjuna University and Dr. San Basiva. Uh, uh, was uh, very important for the uh, having this uh, uh, program uh, successful to the end. So with this, uh, I would like to thank you again, the university and all of you colleagues for the invitation. And uh, this is what I have. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much, sir. Uh, so you may now reduce your screen, sir. Yes, please minimize. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that was a very nice present. Yes, uh, sir, regarding this uh, question and answer, uh, I will move directly into the question session, okay? Okay. Okay, so one of, one of the participant is asking in that uh, chat box, which is supposed to be keep in this question, normal question and answer section. And I have just seen in the chat box that uh, he asks that uh, is there any, uh, activities like done so far for the biological control of this sand fly to prevent this uh, leishmaniasis, particularly in Panama. Any biological control? Uh, no, as far as I know, because uh, uh, the sand fly is so ubiquitous in, in the in the natural. Uh, is sand flies are not domestic like mosquitoes. That, that is not something that you can you can easily control. Uh, sunflies are everywhere in the uh, in the outdoors, and, and uh, at least here in Panama, there is a close contact between human communities and and the outdoors and the uh, the jungle. In, in other words, okay, sir. And, and there is a lot of interface between the human communities and the jungle. And in the jungle, you will find a lot of sunflies and you will find a lot of uh, reservoir, which mm. are in front of the Okay. So, so this, it is, it is, it is practical, not practical to control the baby. It's okay. not practical to control the sunfly. Okay, sir. So Asking what are the Ayurvedic medication of leishmaniasis? Ayurvedic uh, medication. Foreign medication. Yeah, Ayurvedic, Ayurvedic medication for leishmaniasis. I don't know. I, I'm okay. not not sure to to have the answer for that. Okay, another one is asking what what is the possible role of this uh, the mobile element in the in your research? In it's a very it's a very good it's a very good question. Uh, I believe uh, mobile elements uh, uh, confer the parasite some, some advantages in a way that it provides a, an additional source of variability so that uh, the parasite is, is more, has more options, more genetic options to uh, tackle the em environmental changes and okay. to adapt to new uh, Okay, sir. okay, okay. Thank you so much, sir. Now, since uh, the time is late in Panama, I, uh, Ricardo, yes. I have I have one question. Uh, yes, uh, Is the is, what about the genetic variants uh, of the Lishmaniasis, uh, which is uh, you identify Lishmania panamensis, uh, is equivalent to other species in uh, Latin America, uh, or it is different from that? In different, but in terms of what? Yeah, genome genome variation. 
genome variation. In 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 terms of it genome, genome. In it terms was sequenced. Of... No, it was sequenced. So what yeah. uh, what is the major difference between uh, other species in uh, Latin America and uh, the species which you have sequenced in? Uh, uh, well, in, in Latin America, we have we in Latin America we have uh, species from both uh, subgenus, the Leishmania Leishmania and the Leishmania viania. And in yes. the case of Leishmania viania, we have already uh, uh, genome data from Leishmania guyanensis, Leishmania brasiliensis, and Leishmania panamensis. Yes. And uh, in the case of Leishmania, Leishmania subgenus, uh, there are uh, there is genome genome data from uh, Leishmania infantum chagasi, and from Mexicana. Yes. And uh, I don't remember if we have another one. Probably we have another one. And uh, the differences are so many. Yes. Uh, some of the differences are those that I uh, already showed in, in the presentation. Uh, huge differences are between the Leishmania Leishmania and the Leishmania Viania subgenuses. Yes. Uh, important differences are, for example, the presence in Viania of an active RNA interference uh, machinery. Yes. That is present in Leishmania Leishmania. And that is usually Yes. conserved between the subgenuses. So yes. uh, all the Leishmania viania appear to have this, this uh, machinery and all the uh, Leishmania Leishmania does not appear to have this machinery. No, you, this, uh, the, this difference is going to cause any, any kind of uh, influence on the uh, drug development? And uh, the drugs which are actually being probably used yes, it's going probably is going to have uh, an influence in drug development. Uh, we have to remember that we have about sixty percent of the genome which is unknown function. Yes. So, in I think in both cases we are going to have uh, uh, plenty of options for working with. Yes. But the the presence of an uh, an, an uh, RNA interference machinery. I think it's going to do, it's going to make uh, things a little bit worse for Viania in the okay. sense that uh, these parasites are going to be more plastic and, and more, they have, they will have more genetic variability in order to adapt to selective pressures, like for example, a drug treatment. And uh, uh, for example, uh, I can imagine that these parasites are more easily to generate resistance, like to, for example, antimonials than parasites from the Leishmania, Leishmania uh, uh, subgenus because of these differences. It's, it's uh, any kind of vaccines also been uh, uh, tried for this particular uh, uh, Leishmania at your level? Uh, vaccine. Kind of vaccine, vaccine. No, no, I have to say that Leishmania is, is, a, is a, the best example of neglected disease. Neglected. And it is neglected, so nobody cares about the people with Leishmania because okay. people with Leishmania usually, usually don't die. Yes. And a number of people are mainly uh, from the most poor areas, the people that are in contact with the with these uh, vectors and these reservoir. Mm. And uh, those people uh, are not big numbers. They don't die. And they are not important for uh, the uh, big pharma, the people okay. that prepare vaccines for all the diseases. OK, thank you, Ricardo. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. See you again after a long time. <laughs> <laughs> very good to see you again. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much for the invitation. Thank you. Okay. So if there is no any other question, uh, before we conclude, I would like to say thank you, Dr. Ricardo uh, Leonard, once again for your valuable and informative presentation. And I, and I would like to say heartfelt thanks to our honorable uh, Vice Chancellor, Professor 
uh, KSR on several and Mr. Suras for handling uh, all this technical uh, device. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, okay, sir. Now, uh, hello, Dr. Carlos. Hello. Oh, uh, okay. Now, we, I think you are ready right now, right? Are you ready? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I'm ready. Now we, now we can proceed, right? Okay, yeah, we'll proceed to the next session. Screen. Okay, we'll proceed to the next session. Now, okay, uh, good morning, everyone. I'm very thankful for this invitation. We are very honored to share our, the results of our research with you. Um, today, I'm going to talk about all the projects that were derived from the sequencing of the genome of the Shimena Panamensis. As so one of our interests is in developing drugs and discovering vaccines against this disease. Uh, the current, there are few pharmacological treatments currently available, and the most used are pentavalent antimonials. They're, they have been used since the 1940s, but they have several drawbacks. One is that the treatment is too long. It's around uh, 20 days. You need to uh, put the patients at doses of 20 milligrams of the compound per kilogram of body weight. So, and the thing is that this, this uh, treatment is very toxic. It causes damage to kidneys and liver. And also there are increasing reports of therapeutic failure that will be due to resistance. So uh, the other drawback uh, in the treatment is that there are no vaccines approved in humans. And most of the candidates that are currently in clinical phase were not designed, designed for the BNS subgenus, are mostly designed for the Leishmania subgenus. They were the species that cause a visceral Leishmaniasis belong. So we decided to start uh, studying local fill isolates of Leishmania panamensis and also generate our own mutants in the laboratory, looking for determinants of resistance against antimony. And in the, in, during that research also identify possible new drugable targets. As Ricardo mentioned earlier, uh, Mania has a very plastic genome and they lack a regulation of the uh, levels of the messenger RNAs at the, trans uh, the transcription level. They mainly regulate them by gene dosage using all those mechanisms that Ricardo mentioned earlier, either by aneuploidy they could have a, also tandem gene arrays and episomic amplification. In all, three, in all these ways, they can control the levels of a specific, a specific genes that will be useful for a given environmental stress. So we started collecting field isolates and also we decided to generate or own a strain resistant to antimony. For that, first we needed to establish an in vitro bioassay for quantification of the parasite susceptibility to antimony. We established two different methods depending on our budget. One is based on luminescence in when we use beta luciferin and and a recombinant luciferase, and when they react in the presence of ATP, uh, it turns into oxyluciferin and uh, emits light. So we can see uh, light is an indirect measurement of live cells. The other alternative was using fluorescence. For that, we use resafurin. And it is reduced to a fluorescent pore, resorufin, in the presence of NADH. 
So first, we we use we uh, implement all these optimizations in Promasi goals. That is the uh, uh, culture phase of the of Leishmania parasite, and we use amphotericin B. That is another drug used against Leishmaniasis as a control. And we saw if we were able to replicate the IC50 values of amphotericin B. Uh, amphotericin B using the luminescence bioassay. I need to tell you that normally to make this quantification, you need to infect macrophages with the, with the parasite. You need to stain those cells and quantify the, the parasitite cells uh, when, you, when you put a, uh, any drug. And we see here reproducible results at 24, uh, 48 hours that are similar to the previous quantification method for uh, establishing the IC50. For then we tested the compound that we're going to use uh, to challenge the parasite with antimony. The drugs that are used to treat leishmaniasis have Anti uh, antimony in their pentavalent form, but actually the pentavalent form is a prodrug. The active form is a trivalent ion. Um, to give the uh, the trivalent ion to the promastigot, we use this compound, potassium antimonyl tartrate. And here we calculate the IC50 of our reference strain, the same one that was a sequence in our previous project was the one that we used to select through antimony challenge and generate resistance. Here we compare the results of the IC50 value using luminescence and using fluorescence. And you can see that uh, the values are very similar. So we can exchange uh, between methods depending on our budget. The luminescence uh, method is a little bit is more expensive than the fluorescent one. So depending on which budget we have, we can use both methods confidently because they have roughly the same results. So the next step was to generate the antimony resistance strain. So what we did is that we uh, challenged our cultures with increasing concentrations on trivalent antimony. We started with a value lower than the calculated IC50 to let the parasite a, a get more comfortable with that doses. And then we get increases up to 100, 200, 400, 800, 1600, and 2000 micromolar antimony. Uh, at this selection step, we left the culture for four weeks, then we extracted DNA in each step so we can measure the changes in the genome through, throughout the process. This is the curve that shows the final EC50 of roughly 2000 micromolar. Also, we started to collect some field isolates. Um, for this comparison, we use the uh, two field isolates that were not reported with treatment failure previously. We also calculate the IC50 values and we can see that are notably lower than our reference strain in the lab, 26 and five micromolar only. So the next step as after we establish the assay and we generate the mutant was to characterize all the polymorphisms that were possibly caused by this selective pressure. As Ricardo mentioned, as the genome dosage is a main a driver of the genetic variability of Leishmania, we focus a special attention in this. So here you can see a heat map when I'm showing you each of the selection steps with different antimony concentrations. And in the y-axis, you can see 
the chromosomes, the 35 chromosomes and the shamanic. The colors denote the SOMI level, ranging from two in blue up to six in red. And we can see that our, our reference strain with no selective pressure was already trisomic in these chromosomes and tetrasomic in chromosome 31 as Ricardo showed. And some of the chromosomes were uh, increased their copy number as we increased the doses of antimony. Notably, chromosomes 1 and 18, they increased their SOMI up to tetrasomic. Chromosome 31 increased up to exosomic. And chromosome 23, this one here, it increases transiently to pentasomic and then it lowers again his SOMI up to tetrasomic, or is still higher than the original one. When we compare the results of the mutant with the field isolates, we can see that actually in the field, there is little variation in the SOMI of the different chromosomes. Here we compare our lab strain before selection and the two iso field isolates. You can see that it's mostly diploid, the field isolates are mostly diploid. And they're only this isolate is only trisomic in chromosome one. But the feature that all share is that chromosome 31 is still tetrasomic. In these graphics, we can see these are read-dead graphics, as Ricardo explained in the last in the last presentation. Um, we can map the reads of the in the of the different uh, against their different genes. And we can see the level of copies in a gene. This region is an amplified region of chromosome 23. And you can see all the, uh, the colors show you the, the doses of antimony. And you can see that here in the higher doses, we have here a tandem array in a region that is, that is known as the H locus. This region has different transporters, including the MRPA, that is the multi resistant protein A, that is known to be a transport mechanism to eliminate a toxic substances from inside the cell. So it's one of the proposed mechanisms that Lechmana uses to a, liberate antimony and control the toxicity uh, originated by, by this compound. Also, this array has other kind of transporters like the ABCC is a kind of ABC transporter also that is also, is also thought to be involved in antimony expulsion from inside the cell. In panel B, we can see a region in chromosome 34. This region actually has the opposite behavior. You can see that in the lower concentrations of antimony, we have higher copies of this region. And as we increase antimony concentration, it lowers. It is interesting because this region possess different important genes. One of the, of the most important is a bioptorine transporter that is used to uh, import terines that are used in the folate metabolism. And the folate metabolism is important for DNA and RNA synthesis, also for amino acid, amino acid metabolism. So one of the possible explanations could be that even though the parasite is under a stress that force it to overexpress some genes that could be useful to eliminate this drug that we are uh, with, that we're using to challenge the parasite. The amount of energy and resources are limited. So somehow the parasite should level that. And one of the responses could be 
a reduce the level of other non-essential genes for that kind of challenge, and also down-regulated pathways that are used for DNA synthesis. It can control the overexpression of this region and don't let it go up to the point that will be lethal to the parasite. One uh, mutation that we were expecting to find in this uh, mutant selected strain was a deletion in the in one subtelomeric region of chromosome 31, where a gene encoding for another transporter known as, as a aquaglyceroporin one is found. This is a transporter that is used to import. Uh, certain substances and is thought to be one of the mechanisms from uh, that is used for the antimony to enter the cells. But we actually did not found that a uh, deletion where we're analyzing only the different mutants in the different state of, of selection. But when we compare with the field isolate, we notice that the field isolates have a higher copy number in this subtelomeric region. That means that our lab strain before selection was already has a partial deletion in this region. And that may be an explanation of the higher IC50 of our lab strain in, their, in its basal level compared with the field isolates. So it has a basal level of resistance already before or initial exposure to the to antimony. We also, besides the changes in ploidy and SOMI, we also estimate the changes in the copy number of individual genes. And we can see that most of the genes that increase their copy number through the challenge with antimony were genes related with Virulence, where virulence factor, like this phosphoglycan, B13, galactosat transferase, a, a lot of amastine, the GP63, that was already mentioned by Ricardo. So that could be explained because uh, not only uh, overexpressing uh, ch channels that pull, uh, that can expel the drug out of the system is useful for the parasite. Also, there are reports that increasing the fitness of the parasite for invading the host will make less efficient the treatments that we use to treat the parasite. We also look for SNPs in, in these mutants, but most of the SNPs that we found were found in hypothetical proteins or proteins with not known function. As Ricardo said, we were able to characterize the function of three new, 300 new proteins using gene models and bioinformatic tools, but not all the proteins can be characterized using this methodology. But one of the promising results of this project is we can, we have now uh, selected those proteins that change, those genes that change their number, but we still don't know the, the function. Now the next step will be to uh, perform characterization experiment to know their function and to know if they are relevant for antimony resistance or if they are only amplifying by a stochastic mechanism, maybe because they are close to other genes that are, are actually involved in the resistance mechanisms. That's something that we need to figure out with further experiments. The results from this project were published uh, last year in the journal Genes from the uh, from MDPI editorial. And the other project that was derived from the genome analysis was to identify and evaluate potential immunogenic peptides. 
this uh, uh, had in mind to develop a vaccine, an effective vaccine against Ishmania bian species. Um, it has been uh, characterized that most of the immune response against the Schmania parasite is cellular, not humoral. So uh, the most important for developing an anti leishmania vaccine is to identify T cell epitopes, uh, both for activating CD8 positive cells, that will be those that are presented by the major isocompatibility complex of class one, and also CD4 positive cells that are activated by peptides presented by the major isocompatibility complex of class two. Um, so for our bioinformatic predictions, first we selected which alleles in the population we're going to use to predict peptides. So as we are focused in developing vaccines against the Schmania bian species, and they are located in Central and South America, we decided first to identify which allele, alleles for MHC class one and MHC class two are the most abundant in those regions. So uh, in the databases, we were able to uh, find which, which are the most abundant alleles in South America, but not information for, for Central America was available. So in order to predict which ones are the most abundant in Central America, we made a compilation of the most abundant alleles in North and South America, uh, hypothesizing that as uh, Central America is in the middle and there is a lot of migration and moving between the two areas, Central America will be a, a, a combination of both areas. Then we use four different softwares that rely on machine learning algorithms. What they use is that we introduce the whole proteome of Leishmania panamensis. And for this project, actually, we not only use the information of our reference genome, we also include another uh, genome of Leishmania panamensis that was sequenced by other group. And also we include two different sequence strains of Leishmania brasilensis. And then we use this whole protein and we present it to the software and it looks in a database of epitopes that have al already been characterized and they have information about their immunogenicity. And based on that information, the algorithm predicts according to sequence, which are the most probable immunogenic peptides in our in our set of proteins. Here we can we use four different programs because different algorithms have different levels of sensitivity and also different levels of error. So we want we wanted to compare different strategies and based on those results decide which peptides we're gonna use for or for further experiments and to test in, in, in the laboratory. In this graphic, you can see a, in different colors the numbers of predicted peptides by the different programs. And also you can see two different lines. This program ranks the peptides according to, they give a rank that is based on the machine learning prediction. And also it gives another rank based on the predicted uh, affinity to the MHC pocket. Uh, you can, so we decided to use two different strategies. We can use either the union of both programs or the intersection. The intersection uses the peptides that were common to all programs and the union use all the peptides derived from the programs indecisively if they were common or not. Also, we, use, uh, we perform an extra selection step, uh, including if there are strong binders or not. 
And you can see that uh, the number of candidates reduces drastically when we uh, introduce this extra selection criteria. Uh, one important thing to mention is that none of the peptides that were identified was able to, uh, to interact with all the alleles. So a single vaccine formulation using a single peptide it seems not feasible to protect the whole population. So maybe the best strategy will be to use a, a vaccine formulation with different peptides that could cover a, a broader is a spectrum of the population in Latin America. With this information, we decided to uh, elaborate a peptide database so we can share with the scientific community what are the different peptides available for, the, for possibly developing a vaccine. And when uh, building this database, we also include other uh, characteristics of the peptides as uh, solubility, uh, neutral pH, or also if they are synthesizable. So the researcher could take this into consideration before choosing the peptides because it's not only important that, are the, the, that they are actually immunogenic, but they also should be soluble in the in physiological pH for a viable vaccine formulation. This database is now public uh, in this website for the whole scientific community, and they can query the database using the, the different uh, filter criteria that I mentioned and follow their, their own pipelines to, for further characterization. We use, we perform a validation of our database to know how efficient was predicting peptides comparing with previously uh, reported research from other groups. This group, these four papers that I show here, uh, they try to predict immunogenic peptides in three different species of the Leishmania, Leishmania, Leishmania subgenus, Leishmania major, Leishmania infantum, and Leishmania donovani. Uh, as you can see, none of those uh, uh, projects were done in Leishmania bien species. And from the total number of peptides that they were able to characterize, we can see that in B, present in Viania, there were only half roughly half or less than half of the peptides that they characterize and present and from those peptides present in our database, we have a very good result almost from 70 up to 100% of the pep peptides were identified by our bioinformatics approach. But also you can see that most of the peptides that are identified are not found in Viania. So that shows the importance of performing Viania specific research for developing a vaccine, because as most of the peptides that are characterized in the Leishmania, Leishmania subgenus, there are most of the vaccine candidates that are already in clinical trials, maybe those vaccines will not be effective for our population of parasites and will not be effective to protect our population against Leishmania bien species. This project is also already is published. Actually, it was the last paper for Alejandro Thesis, the uh, Ricardo explained is our main bioinformatician in the group. And now further steps uh, for developing a vaccines. We already got a grant for evaluate candidate peptides in the laboratory. So first, we are use our own filter criteria to select some of those peptides that are already in the database. Um, we going to optimize those predictions, including not only 
prediction by sequence as we did in the database or also prediction by structure using molecular docking. From those experiments, we plan to select at least 40 candidates that we're going to evaluate in the lab. Uh, first, uh, performing some biochemical and bio biophysical assays to determine if the binding predicted by the, the, the bioinformatic tools is real. And then those that are the have that are the strong binders through the biochemical and biophysical characterization, we're going to perform a T cell proliferation assays using a cell from patients that were infected in the past and cure. So they they already have a antigen presenting cells that could present or peptides to microphages and lymphocytes and see if there is a T cell prolifer proliferation. If that phase is successful, then we can go on to the animal model phase. And the last thing that I want to mention is that, as I mentioned previously, we identifying different genes that are change their gene doses through drug selection is useful to identify possible new drug targets. And identifying a character, characterizing those drug targets will be used for prediction of molecules with antileishmanial activity. And to test those molecules, it is required an in vitro assay for high throughput drug screening. Actually, we already a test some a synthetic a compound libraries that are analogs of some compounds that are known to have certain levels of, of activity against Schmania. But the drawback of the old assay is that it relies on infecting microphages, staining them with GIMSA, and then manually counting all the different replicates, controls, and the different points using different drugs. So you can imagine that a single experiment for screening a whole compound library will take months because, uh, you know, an experiment that you perform in one week with, let's say, six compounds will take weeks to for counting and to uh, to quantify what, what was the IC50 of these compounds. For that reason, we decided to uh, uh, implement a high throughput assay using a, a transfected Leishmania with GFP. For that purpose, we use this strategy. We use uh, the P-Lexi plasmid is commercially available and it has these recombination sites that are complementary with the uh, ribosomal RNA locus in Leishmania. So we can introduce our marker, in this case, GFP, and then transfect the Leishmania parasites. And the transfection will not be transient because it is not introduced as a plasmid. It's introduced as a linearized plasmid that then is incorporated into the chromosome permanently. So we transfected or a Leishmania strain with this linearized plasmid, and we were able to isolate four clones that were highly infectious and with high levels of fluorescence. Here you see the relative units of fluorescence, and here you see the percentage of the population that was actually infected and fluorescent. As you can see, the clone F11 was the one with the highest level of fluorescent and was the one that we chose for further experiments and characterization. Uh, as one of the steps in drug candidate characterization is after we 
perform the step in in vitro assays is to implement the animal model. I we wanted to check if the fluorescence was stable when infected mice, and also if the transfection process did not affect the the viral lens and infectivity of the parasite in mice. And as you can see here, we determined that measuring the food, uh, we inoculate those parasites in the food pad of the of each mouse, and we measure the the infection, measuring the thickness in the food pad. It's an indirect measure of inflammation. As you can see here, the parasite uh, preserve the infectivity, and also their fluorescence after. Uh, 12, 12 weeks of infection, we recover the parasite from each of the mouse use. As, as you can see here, all of the uh, strains recovered preserve high levels of fluorescence. So in this way, we check that the construct was stable and the parasite did not lose fluorescence. Then we started to perform the bioassays infected, infecting murine microphages. As you can see in this first panel, we first had low levels of infection. Uh, only 46% of the microphages were infected at, after 12 hours post infection. And at 24 hours, only 2% were infected. Uh, after Passing the parasite through mouse and also changing the temperature, lower the temperature from 37 degrees to 34. That uh, we found that were the ideal condition for Leishmania species that cause cutaneous Leishmaniasis. We get an increase in the percentage of infected microphages up to 65% after, after 24 hours. But still, we need we needed to to fine tune some of the paramet parameters of the assay to get a similar amounts at forty eight or even seventy two hours. Uh, then we decided to uh, shift from mouse cells to human cells. So we started using a uh, human um, a monocytic human cell line known as THP1 and differentiated microphages from that cell line. And we finally tune all the parameters of our assay. So as you can see here in different replicates, uh, 20, after 24 hours post-infection and 48 hours post-infection, we're able to have between 78 to 80% of the microphages uh, infected and um, with high levels of fluorescence. That is good because now we have a stable infection, good levels of fluorescence, so we can track uh, or drug acid experiment up to 48 hours and trust in the results that we have if we see a reduction of, of fluorescence. We were able before the COVID pandemic to test uh, a library of some compounds. And as you can see here, uh, normally what we uh, have here is a control of infected cells with not a stimulus that they should remain mostly infected with high levels of fluorescence. We have a positive drug control. We use amphotericin B and we can see here a clear reduction in the level of fluorescence that is a and direct indication of parasite death. And here we have the other compounds that were evaluated. In this case, you can see that none of them were effective against Leishmania. But the good thing is the assay is working properly. And actually, this is only a representative a graphic, but in that way, we were able to analyze 24 compounds. One thing that was impossible before with the last assay, that it, uh, having those results in one week was merely impossible. Uh, possibly it could have taken two or three months. 
with the previous uh, methodology. Now we are hoping to evaluate more compounds, but the thing is that with the current COVID-19 pandemic, we were forced to, to stop our experiment until further advice. But in summary, those are the postgenomic projects that we have. We have characterized drug resistant determinant. We have identified new hypo, uh, unknown uh, genes with unknown function that we can further characterize and establish if they have a role in drug resistant and are potential drugable targets. We have uh, characterized several potential immunogenic peptides at bioinformatic level prediction. And now we are about to start the evaluation in the laboratory. And also we have optimized our drug screening assay with this fluorescent strain. So now we are able to uh, screen large and large uh, numbers of compounds in a matter of few weeks. So I want to thank all the members of our group, uh, starting with Ricardo that is our advisor. And in this project have been involved a lot of uh, postdocs, technicians, students from bachelor's and master's degree. And all of those projects have been uh, financed by the National Secretary of Science, Technology and Innovation, and also the National System for Investigation. Also, we had several collaborators in University of Florida, also in Instituto como Institute Gorgas, that is the main epidemiological institute in Panama. And physici physicians for, from that institute are the ones that are helping us to collect all the field isolates of Leishmania. So uh, again, I want to thank the, your kind invitation to share or or results with all of you. Uh, we are open to all of your questions. So thank you so much. <clears throat> okay, thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Carlos. Uh, uh, that was a very uh, nice uh, uh, presentation, very informative. Thank you so much. Now, a few questions are keeping this uh, question and answer box. So I, I will just uh, read down the question and whatever you can answer, then you can address them, okay? Uh, one is asking, what, what is the major variation it has with the lace money Donovani? But the major variation in terms of what specifically? Like uh, it must be with uh, uh, genetic makeup, like uh, genetic variation. Because the, maybe they are interested with the lace money Donovani because this is most common in India. So, oh. yeah. So maybe they are interested to know what is the major genetic variation. Well, uh, uh, earlier Ricardo mentioned some of those variations as he said, uh, Leishmania Donovani and Leishmania Panamensis belong to different uh, Leishmania uh, genera. Mm. And because of that, they have different, some relevant differences like the RNA mechanism that is only present in Vienna and actually it's thought to be a indicative of a closer evolutive uh, relationship of Leishmania Vienna with older trypanosomes. So maybe Leishmania Leishmania is a, a newer one. In terms of the drug resistance that I explained earlier, uh, most of the changes in the drug transporters are also shared with Leishmania Donovani. They have, also, they have also been identified. So I think that most of the most important changes will be those uh, genes with unknown function that we still need to characterize in the laboratory. Okay, okay, thank you. And another question is, uh, other than this uh, bioinformatics study, did you perform any uh, weight lab study on plasma cell production made by injecting peptides? No, not yet, because uh, all the, the vaccine development project is only at the stage of bioinformatic prediction so far. 
-hmm. we recently got the funding for the laboratory uh, experiments uh, last year mm. and as we we need to use uh, PBNCs from patients we need uh, approval from a bioethics committee so it's already on the review and also we are we are waiting for for a date that we can restart our experiments in the laboratory you know that we are currently currently under lockdown but uh, those experiments are a program for the future surely okay okay yes uh, one 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 of the participants is also asking what is the future aspect of this genetic research the future aspect okay uh, as we want to apply for funds to characterize some of these genes. Uh, thankfully, there are now several ways to characterize and modify genes in Leishmania. There are new methods published using CRISPR, the CRISPR-Cas system uh, that will be useful to knock out some of those genes and uh, look for a loss of function. Also, as we have a, an advantage, uh, you, we can use also RNA, RNAi mechanism in Ishmania Viana, as Ricardo explained, this subgenus has the system. So these two mechanisms will be used to characterize those genes. And if we identify those genes uh, and the proteins they encode, and if they have a, a role in in resistance or fitness of the parasite against drugs, we can look for collaboration to get the 3D structure of those proteins and then implement bioinformatics, structural bioinformatics to design new, dr new drugs. Or, okay. or and also to look in or in in libraries of already existing characterized compounds and look if they have any affinity or capacity of inhibition of those proteins and with those prediction test them in the lab okay okay thanks thank you so much so uh once again i would like to thank dr ricardo and dr carlos for sharing us your experience and giving us your valuable time uh with us and i hope all the participants benefited uh, this uh, this uh, webinar okay so uh, thank you once again Thank you very much. Thank you, Thank you very much. And good night. <laughs> See you. Goodbye. Okay, goodbye.